recording in three, two, one, and I am live with Michael Sunshine. Michael, how are you, my friend? I'm good. Great to be with you. Oh, it's like likewise, likewise. Uh, Michael, usually I start with, um, you know, when or where did we first meet? I, I, I'm trying to remember. It's probably been a while, right? It's oh, what, wow. 2015 or something? I have no idea. I don't even know if Bitcoin um, was more than three digits long at the time <laughs> in the U.S. dollar term. Right. Um, which just goes to show you how long you've been around the space and how long I've been around the space. Yes, yes. So, okay, Michael, a couple of pink elephants. First of all, congratulations on your new role um, with Grayscale. So, first of all, like amazing work with what you're doing. I saw the news today about what was it? Grayscale adds 18 times the Bitcoin mine supply in one day. Like, is this real life? Like, talk to me here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, you know, I, I think that, you know, we certainly um, are very, very encouraged by the level of investment that we're seeing across the Grayscale family of products. When I think about what 2020 looks like, I, um, it just surpassed our expectations in, in every sense of, of our expectations, really. Um, I think we raised about $5.7 billion in 2020, which is four, more than 4x the cumulative amount that we raised over the preceding six years. So that should just go to show people just how much demand there is for investors to gain exposure to this asset class. Um, that being said, as much as the team has certainly been, you know, and I'm so proud of the team just looking back at 2020 and all that it accomplished and how much hiring we did and just how many new investors we onboarded. Um, I'm very pleased to share that we're seeing that momentum carry into 2021 and not only carry, but actually Sunny, I think it's I think it's accelerating. Um, <laughs> so um, it is going it is shaping up to be a very interesting 2021 to say the least. My goodness. Hey, and you know what? Um, one of the I know, again, we have a limited time, so I want to be uh, mindful of it. Um, one of the things I'm trying to capture, Michael, is I always say, you know, Bitcoin at the end of the day is just nothing but ones and zeros. It's the people and the stories behind the people that really make up Bitcoin. And, uh, and you have been at the epicenter of you know, this movement, if you will. Um, and so really curious, uh, you know, in the short period we have, if you can help maybe the listeners understand your story. Uh, and again, some people start with great grandparents, some people start with their first job, uh, you can take it wherever you want. Sure, so from my perspective, Bitcoin was not something that was really much of anything um, on my radar going back to 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I was at the time working for a bulge bracket investment bank and was back in business school part-time. And it was funny because at business school, I was really one of the only people that was going to class every night after work that was showing up in a suit and a tie. And, <laughs> and you bet your bottom dollar that that suit was gray or navy every single day and true <laughs> you know, bulge bracket bank uniform, mm. you know, you just had to kind of carry, carry that look. And I was just meeting kids in school that were, you know, getting their MBAs um, that, you know, were, were going to take over family businesses or were entrepreneurs or mm. whatever it was. And it really, for me, I think helped me reshape and, and redefine what it meant to be successful. It didn't mean you had to go work at a bank. And I made the decision based on those externalities that I was going to leave JP Morgan. I had now worked at three bulge bracket banks and it was important to me to go someplace where I had a lot more autonomy and a lot more kind of connectivity to my successes and failures between my role and the company. And I knew I wanted to stay in finance. So I started interviewing at family offices, hedge funds, things like that, and uh, had the very fortunate pleasure to meet a man um, that I know you think of quite fondly as well, Sonny, uh, and that is Mr. Barry Silver. Um, so Barry had uh, started a company back then called Second Market that was primarily trading private company stock. And he had personally gotten bit by the Bitcoin bug. He'd made some investments in Coinbase and BitPay and a couple of different companies around the ecosystem started buying Bitcoin and it rubbed off on the company's board and 
a lot of the employees. We started a Bitcoin trading desk. And at the time, he had also started the underpinnings of what eventually became Grayscale and had launched a long only passively managed Bitcoin fund. So this was that was about, so we launched that product September, 2013. I met Barry in January of 2014. So call it three, four months into the life cycle of that. Okay, and okay. Bitcoin was about 800 at the time. Mm. Um, mm. And I went in to meet Barry, I'll be honest with you. Um, when I got called into this interview, I had never yeah. heard of Barry, who, who okay. had won every award under the sun as an entrepreneur and um, I had right. never heard of second market. Um, I didn't even know there were secondary markets for things like Facebook stock, et cetera. And again, when Bitcoin would maybe flash up on CNBC from time to time, yeah, everyone yeah. at the bank was kind of like, yeah, that's funny. Let's get back to, you know, Caterpillar earnings or, you know, whatever's going <laughs> on with Google today or whatever it may be. Right. And um, I met Barry and he really sold me on this vision, not only for Bitcoin and digital currencies as a whole, as an asset class, but really was one of those people, unlike anyone I'd met before, who overtly demonstrated an ability to see around corners, to really have the foresight to say, this is gonna be an asset class, investors are gonna want exposure to it, but it has attributes that make it tough for people to access it directly. And so I want to build a business based on those challenges. And I said, Barry, like, this sounds nuts, you know, whatever. I had no <laughs> idea what Bitcoin was. And yeah. um, I told him I was actually going to go work for a hedge fund. And he said, you know what, Michael, if you want to do that, you can go do that. But you know what? I'd also venture to guess that those opportunities will always be there for you. So take a chance. Come help me build something. And if at any point it feels like it's going off the rails, you can leave and, you know, I'll give you a great recommendation. Don't worry about it. Mm. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, give me 24 hours and I'll write up an offer for you. Oh, and sure enough, within 24 hours, Barry made me an offer and I joined him. Um, I took a huge career move, um, huge career risk. I think people thought I was insane. Um, again, this is January, 2014. Bitcoin had just come off that $1,200 all time high. Bitcoin was around 800 and I joined to help lead the sales effort for this Bitcoin investment product that at the time had $60 million of AUM. And uh, that was, you know, I, I got to say, honestly, have never looked back since that day. And, you know, talking to you now, I've, you know, worked so closely with Barry over the past eight years, building that trust and partnership and built out the team and built out the product suite. And, very proud to talk to you today as now Grayscale's chief executive officer and overseeing a team of 25, 10, uh, nine investment products and over, I guess, $27 billion in assets under management. So it's really just been an unbelievable journey. And, and it's really all kudos, uh, you know, to Barry for having the vision for, for what Grayscale became. Amazing. Amazing, Michael. Well, uh, yeah, I got goosebumps, man. I'm not going to lie. I, I often referred to Barry as like the Batman of Bitcoin. <laughs> you know, um, I, he's just moving mountains that people don't even know about. Uh, and full disclosure, yeah, uh, Barry invested in Unocoin in December 2014. Yep. Uh, or no, in, sorry, in mid-2014, rather. So, and I remember uh, he had reached out to us and Satvik couldn't even like fathom the fact that somebody would want to invest in a Bitcoin company, let alone ours. And uh, Barry had Barry was tenacious enough to follow up a few times and, and remind us that look, you know, I'm an investor in Coinbase and BitPay. Uh, you know, let's do this. And and so he, he I, I I often say he believed in Unocoin, even though I'm the one who bought the domain on GoDaddy. <laughs> he believed in it before I did. <laughs> um, but Barry has that, you know. But I just just to kind of just touch on that though, Michael. You know, you said you know he kind of showed you the light or, you know, in terms of how this was going to be an asset class. Do you recall what those things were that he mentioned? Or did you just kind of go a bit on faith or um, a bit of I'm both. just curious? I, mean, like, I like, think what, Barry what? kind of mm. analogized for me the idea of digital currency, you know, eventually being the springboard to financial inclusion, um, which, you know, he was kind of talking about these change the world um, you know, messages and, and, and constructs, which 
you know, when you get up every day and you go work at a bulge bracket bank, you're not exactly, uh, you know, thinking along those lines. And so I was super taken with the words he was sharing. Um, and you may mm. be interested to know this, how he determined partially my candidacy for this role was in true oh. Wall Street fashion, Barry picked up a pen, handed it to me, and asked me to sell him the pen. Um, and I guess I did a good job selling it to him, but um, that, that's really one of the foundational moments of our, of our relationship. I love it. I love it. Um, okay, so uh, you know, just to, just to go a bit deeper on the on the grayscale note, then I mean, if I'm doing the numbers correct, is that like a thousand x growth or something in your time frame that in the story yeah, that you just told? Something. Sixty million to seventy billion? Or started, did I started miss with sixty here? million, and today we have about twenty seven billion. Yeah, so it's it's just my lord. Run. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. So you're like, like in the middle of like this, um, and, 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 and I was going to ask you this 18 X, what, what is that specifically referring to? So great. So today something happened, right. And, and what is this news for people who are just like tuning in? So it's grayscale adds 18 times the Bitcoin mine supply in one day. So does that mean like whatever Bitcoin is mining grayscale bought 18 times that amount in one yeah, day. So I, I think the metric that people are often looking at and, and often using the growth of the grayscale family of products um, as a metric for adoption by the investment community of digital assets is looking that in a given time frame, they're making a comparison between how many new Bitcoin are being created and being brought online through the Bitcoin mining process, right, directly as a result of the Bitcoin protocol and algorithm that underlies it, and comparing that growth in circulation with the growth in the Bitcoin under management inside the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. And I think a lot of people get very encouraged by the fact that the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, the world's largest Bitcoin investment vehicle, is growing at many, many, many multiples of the rate at which new Bitcoin are entering circulation and using that as kind of a barometer for the, the health and interest of folks um, allocating capital to the space. And, and what are you seeing? Because we hear a lot, right, about, oh, well, institutions, and you hear about the Michael Saylors of the world, et cetera, et cetera. But, but curious, like, uh, I mean, are you able to share a bit in terms of, like, just generally speaking, like, what is this? What are we seeing here? Are, are these actually, like, you know, by the way, I didn't, I don't know if you heard yesterday, the Canadian prime or the ex, uh, former prime minister said that he believes that Bitcoin could be, you know, part of the reserve uh, asset base here in Canada. Um, just insane, like stuff that, you know, I'm sure five years ago, we wouldn't even be thinking would be like, you know, possible this soon. But but curious, like, is it? Yeah, are you able to comment on like, where is this phenomenon coming from? Is it kind of just widespread? Is it singular? Is it? Uh... Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's coming from all over the place. But I'd say the dominant inflows that Grayscale is experiencing is from the institutional segment. So we're talking about hedge funds, um, endowments and pensions, um, certainly no shortage of high net worth individuals and, and family offices. But you know, for for again, you know, Sunny, a lot of people want this exposure. But again, talking to you today in early 2021, it'll be interesting to see how much the digital asset class, um, you know, digital currency asset class pervades the traditional system over the coming year. Because today, the places where investors are typically allocating capital, bonds, stocks, ETFs, et cetera, those are still not the same avenues where they could access Bitcoin or they could access Ethereum. And so because these assets exist outside of those traditional places, Grayscale is really offering the investment community a solution that allows them to access this asset class in a way that feels familiar, that gives them the ability to, to do so without them having to figure out buying it, transferring it, storing it, safekeeping it, and instead lets them invest in an investment fund like they often do for accessing other things, whether it's bonds or gold or oil or, you know, any of those other broadly, you know, construed access products. 
Yeah, and, and Michael, you brought up uh, Ethereum. I'm just curious, you know, and that's another question that I think a lot of people wonder is, is like, oh, but people have this tendency to say, well, this is a Bitcoin only phenomenon. Institutions are only gravitating towards Bitcoin. Um, but I find that hard to believe in the sense that, you know, Ethereum traditionally and all these other crypto assets, whether we like it or not, have seen, you know, the ripple effect, oh, bad choice of words, but you know what I'm saying, right? Um, they've seen that type of uh, growth as well. But is that, or are you seeing this, uh, this institutional, um, you know, bull run really focused mostly on Bitcoin? Um, you know, I, it's hard to say. I, I would say, you know, if you'd asked me this question 12, 18 months ago, I uh -huh. tell you that consistently everybody's first taste of crypto is Bitcoin. Mm. Today, I'd say, you know, certainly over the course of 2020, we saw massive growth in the Grayscale Ethereum Trust mm. and the emergence of a new breed of investor that is Ethereum only um, or Ethereum first, which was a new um, kind of data point within our investor base. And now we're also seeing the emergence of, a, of an allocator. So folks who want exposure to the ecosystem know that they want that exposure, but they equally know that they will not be able to pick winners and avoid losers. And so they're looking for more of like a broad-based approach. And so we've seen pretty good uptake of our diversified fund, the Grayscale Digital Large Cap Fund. So I think that's another interesting area to monitor is, is those folks that want that exposure um, but but aren't closely tied enough to changes within the ecosystem, which happen quickly, as, as you certainly know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, Michael, um, and again, I just want to be mindful of our time here. So uh, the, the kind of the final, you know, big questions I want to ask you is, is there something that you believe to be true that most others in Bitcoin may disagree with you on? <laughs> it's like the famous Peter Thiel, you know, contrarian question, right? Um, and, and, and from my experience, I find like the answer to that question usually um, leads to opportunities, right? In the sense yeah. that when you ask those types of questions, but, but is there anything that you see kind of like an asymmetric type of deal going on where, where maybe Bitcoiners or, or big people in Bitcoin mostly are, are, have drank the Kool-Aid a bit too much? <laughs> so I don't know that I can necessarily think of something that where I would disagree with folks within digital currency. Mm -hmm. um, but I would maybe say outside of the digital currency ecosystem, mm -hmm. something that is, you know, somewhat irksome is this construct that somehow Bitcoin has failed because we're not running around buying lattes with it. Um, and, and people really need to understand that you know, the near term use cases we're seeing around Bitcoin are as a digital store of value, are as a, you know, replacement for gold or as a gold 2.0, um, as a speculative investment, as an investment that a lot of folks are thinking about as a, you know, maybe early stage, early stage tech investment or um, the next generation of payments, you know, it's, it's being invested in along those lines. And so this kind of preconceived notion around, well, Bitcoin somehow has failed because it hasn't replaced the US dollar or the Euro or the yen, or we're not walking into Starbucks and buying coffee with it, somehow that it's kind of failed its ultimate promise. Um, that's really irksome because it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, mm -hmm. from my seat, you know, this came out of nowhere. Bitcoin came out of nowhere, you know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it has pervaded society so seriously the fact that there are now bitcoin futures traded alongside some of the most established commodities that have been around for millennia the fact that it's received guidance and recognition by every regulatory body i mean i'd go as far as to say you know new asset classes are not born every day and mm. the fact that it has gone and made and gained as much traction as it has is pretty amazing um, so, uh, you know, that, that to me is kind of the one thing that probably stands out the most. Cool. I love it. Hey, Michael, you know, we won the court case in India, right? Like we're I back do. in action. It's awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. And actually, Sonny, I remember, I, I think I was talking to you about this. I was in India in maybe 2015 or maybe 2016, and I was just completely, completely blown away by the idea of, you know, Paytm and, and all of the other um, electronic payment methods that were being so, so widely used there. And 
I think it's been, um, you know, really interesting to see, um, you know, how much, you know, we're seeing in the emerging markets, the uptake of digital assets like Bitcoin. And I think India is certainly an interesting one, particularly when we, tar- when we start talking about gold or, or digital gold because of, you know, how much cultural value, um, you know, Crazy. gold has to, to the Indian um, population. Gold remittance, right? I mean, if you think about the whole remittance kind of equation and what Bitso is doing, um, you know, I, I feel that narrative can also play out in India. India being the largest remitter. Anyways, okay, I'll keep keep that for another time. I, you know, uh, one of my uh, kind of just we got about five minutes left here, Michael. So one of my main themes is is building on Bitcoin, right? Okay, so great NGU number go up, people are getting rich, wonderful. But you know, people like you, and you shared your story a bit, and you know, I and people like Barry, we've not only said, hey, we're gonna invest in this technology, we're gonna invest our time and our mm-hmm. energy. Um, any words to people who are maybe in your seat five years ago or seven years ago that are kind of like, ah, should I make a move into this space? It seems super shady and weird, um, but you know, but also seems like charming and amazing. But like, uh, yeah, like anything to get people to just kind of get up off their seat and and realize that this isn't just about, you know, um, NGU, it's about, you know, you you can change the world potentially and build a business on top of it. Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, it's it's early days, there's opportunities abound. I think, you know, those kind of starting out their careers or deciding if, you know, traditional financial services for them or not, you know, I personally cannot say enough about the foundation that traditional financial services Um, created for me, and I certainly would not be as well positioned to have had the success I did at Grayscale, nor rise to, you know, become the company CEO without that foundational experience of really understanding the underpinnings of our financial system, how assets move around, legalities, regulation, you name it. Um, And so there's, you know, I'm not going to be the person that's going to say, you know, poo-poo to, you know, working in financial services or, you know, kind of jump over that and go straight into tech. What I would say is to a lot of folks, figure out what your North Star is. What's going to make you differentiated? Is it, you know, mm-hmm. the un, basically in, insatiable appetite that firms like us have for engineering talent and wanting to be able to innovate on, on blockchain and, and technology and we're seeing innovation around cryptography and, and other kind of new areas that have not been developed before. Um, or are you going to kind of take a more you know traditional path and spend some time in financial services, get that foundational uh, time in there before you pursue startups or or kind of fintech, um, et cetera. So you know I think there, there's no rhyme or reason. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer, but. I will say the amount of human capital that has and continues to shift into our space is really, really encouraging. It is, isn't it? And and that is the lifeblood of, that's what I think is, is like, in order for NGU to happen, like people need to be dedicating their lives to it. Because if you don't have infrastructure, like you said, you know, with what Grayscale is doing, building infrastructure for institutions, um, if you don't have, you know, retail, if you don't have the ability for people to get in and out, then it's, uh, it's yeah, it's just uh, obviously this thing won't go anywhere. So really, really, really grateful, Michael, that you got to spend this time with me. You know, if at any point in time, I know right now must be a super, super busy time, but in the future, in a week, a month, a year, whenever you're down to do another session, I'd love to do a slightly longer one where maybe we can just kind of, uh, you know, uh, go into some other topics and and pick your brain. But this has been lovely. So any, any parting words where people can maybe the Grayscale website, your Twitter handle, stuff like that? Yeah, of course. So first of all, Sonny, thank Thanks for having me. Always happy to come back and chat and actually be really interesting to see how much progress has been made in this ecosystem, even in just maybe six months from now or Mm -hmm. or at the end of this year. So let's do that. Um, But yeah, to folks looking for resources or wanting to get further involved in the space, definitely visit the Grayscale website, grayscale.co. We have a wealth of resources on there, content about specific protocols, portfolio construction, valuation, you name it. Um, and certainly please follow along the story about Grayscale on Twitter, um, at Grayscale. My Twitter handle is at Sun and Shine. Uh, looking forward to uh, being a hopefully helpful resource uh, to anyone and everyone. Awesome. And that's gray with an A, right? Grayscale, right? It is. It okay, is. awesome. Uh, awesome. Okay, this has been great, Michael. Thank you again. Super grateful. I'm going to kill it, but just wait around for 30 seconds. 